It is doing it. All right. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Observable Readings, brought to you by the St. Louis Poetry Center. Um, first, we'd like to thank the Missouri Arts Commission, the Poetry Foundation, and of course, the Cranesburg Art Foundation, who's building the high low we are in right now um, for their generous support. We'd also like you to mark your calendars for the first weekend in March. That's March 4th. For our next reading, it's going to be pretty fabulous um, because Mary Rufel and Mark Wunderlich will be in town. We'll have a show in this building of Mary Rufel's book arts and erasures. Um, and she and Mark will both give a reading in conjunction with that show. First Fridays is that weekend. It's going to be massive, and we hope you can be with us for that. Without further ado, I want to start tonight's reading, and our first reader is Mark Bibbins. Um, we do this little informal survey of the poets because it's a nice way to get to know people, and we ask them uh, questions that we honestly borrowed from the former and much missed Fort Condo reading series. Um, so the dead poet Mark would most like to meet is Gertrude Stein, and he qualifies this as briefly, he doesn't mean a week in the country house. I can see that. <laughs> Favorite city, New York, but he tries to not be a snob about it. Again, yeah. I mean, it is a pretty great place, isn't it? Don't have to use that. Yeah. First concert you ever went to was Missing Persons, and they were fantastic. Um, first record, tape, or CD purchased was Blondie's Heart of Glass. And he says, I still don't know the words. I don't know the words either. I have that. I have that one. Yeah. First book of poetry owned Anne Sexton's 45 Mercy Street because of the Peter Gabriel song. There's a theme in developing here. <laughs> um, favorite movie. One of, I know I have trouble picking as well. Best in show, <laughs> which Catherine O'Hara, I think, walks on water and heals the sick, so yes. Favorite place in the world, park, museum, room, whatever, is wherever a band or DJ I love is playing. There's that theme. Favorite curse word, and I, I do have to say thank you, sir, for not making me say it. It rhymes with blunt. <laughs> <laughs> the profession you secretly wish you were is a service dog trainer. And I think you should tell us why. I think that's an interesting choice. And another interesting choice. I one of the things that we try to do is pull out um, some lines from a poem that really feel in some way emblematic or represent, representative of the work that's going to be read. And I couldn't condense this first poem. It's the one that opens the book, and so I want to read it for you now. Um, it stopped me in my tracks every time I read it. As a house burns, sparks land on the roofs of houses nearby. Some of them will also burn. Some of them will not. Someone asks, are there people inside? Sometimes there are people inside. They may walk out alive or be carried out alive. They may be carried in pieces. They may be carried in bags. They may be carried in smoke. Others in dreaming may wonder whether they ever will wake from the endless dream of sparks clinging to their roofs, floating through their windows, landing on their beds. And the reason that I chose that is because it was the first surprise. The Deep Balloon is so full of surprises. When I picked it up, I was not expecting to be invaded by allergy. But as luck would have it, 13th Balloon was the very last book I took home from the library in March 2020. So we were locked down together, just the two of us. 
and surprise, it offered me relief. Someone has passed this way before and has left a map, a beautifully made map that invites deep study. And here is another surprise, which revealed that I have passed this way before without realizing it. I was in high school during the early years of the AIDS crisis. And as I read Mark's book, I found myself traveling in parallel, inhabiting two times at once. All the death, all the blame, all the fear, all the heroism, all of it was present with me in both times, but surprise, I did not capsize from the weight of it. And that can only be because Mark's book pulled me out. It reconnected me to myself and reminded me that even though I hadn't left my house, I am still a human among humans. So this terrible time, while made of many endings, is not the end. Our singular griefs are also collective. What a surprise relief. Mark Bibbins is the author of four books of poems, most recently 13th Balloon, which received the Tom Gunn Award from the Publishing Triangle. His first collection, Sky Lounge from Grey Wolf, received a Lambda Literary Award. His work has appeared in The New Yorker, Poetry, Paris Review, Best American Poetry Series, and he teaches in the graduate writing programs of the New School in Columbia and directs NYU's Writers Influence Program. Please join me in welcoming Mark Bibbins. Should I put it back on? Is it too much? Um, thank you. Oh my goodness, thank you for that introduction. That, that was more than I deserve. Um, and thank you to Dana for inviting me to read with one of my very favorite people and poets in the whole world, Mary Jo Bang. Um, yeah, this is the first time I've done this in a very long time, but I suspect it's exactly like crashing bike. So. <laughs> Um, I'm going to read some, uh, I guess a lot of poets like to finish with the new stuff, and I'm going to start with the new stuff, um, and then read some of 13th Balloon. Um, okay. So the first, the first poem is called Poem, so D for effort. <laughs> What I'm going to do is get my reading glasses out of my pocket real quick. The vision goes, the mind goes. There. Poem. I've only written one decent joke in my life so far. I say written, although this is the first time I'm actually writing it down. And this isn't even writing, it's typing, which was how Truman Capote summed up Jack Kerouac's whole career. I used to live two doors down from where the latter typed on the road, which I read decades ago and now remember nothing about. When the star of a play dies, someone has to bury the lead. That wasn't a joke, that's awful. Don't be political, don't be sentimental, don't try to be funny in your poems. Take up pickling, knitting, or philately instead. Do anything useful for a change. What do you call a dozen eggs if you're anti-choice? A jury of your peers. I can never find where Marianne Moore used to live in the village, even though there's a plaque, and it's been years since I've walked through the gates of Passion Place after midnight to stand in front of Edie Cummings' apartment. Yes, I'm aware of the problems with him and many of his poems, but I still love a cul-de-sac almost as much as catching incandescent light on my tongue when it runs through the windows of the dead. Obsolescence. I don't know what broke in me when I tried to learn shorthand, but I'm still carrying the pieces around. If I sleep, I more or less become my computer, and why shouldn't that count as work? Having boiled emotional labor down to, I feel, we wait for the checks to arrive. 
Some days I wait a little sure there's an afterlife, that anyone might be reincarnated as a falcon or an elaborate snail. The dead, when they go, don't say, come with us. They say, I'm going, you do what you want. They say death's not so bad, or at least it's not worse. They say death is what you do with it, which sounds, alas, like what I was told about life. When I ran into my dead friend on the street, he didn't seem sad or angry, merely impatient. He asked why I still worried about justice in the same way he might have asked why I was holding a paper map. Gender lets us down. I've tripped over mine so many times, my whole body tastes like a rotting plum. He told me the kind of fruit you balance on your head doesn't matter to the archer, as long as you hold perfectly still. Uh, and I'll uh, read this one for Dana, who is kind enough to um, throw it into the Academy of American Poets poem a day pile. Um, and it's called The End of the Endless Decade. For years, had anyone needed me to spell the word commiserate, I'd have disappointed them. I envy people who are more excited by etymology than I am, but not the ones who can explain how music works. I wonder whether the critic who wrote that the Cocteau Twins were the voice of God still believes it. Why not? What else would God sound like? <laughs> Even though I know better, when I see the word misericordia, I still think suffering, not forgiveness. When we commiserate, we're united not in mercy, but in misery. So let's go ahead and call this abscess of history the greatest commiseration. The difference between affliction and affection is a flick, a lick, but check again. What lurks in the letters is lie. And what kind of luck is that? As the years pile up, our friends become more vocal about their various damages. Won't you let me monetize your affliction, says my friend, the corporation. When I try to enter in my phone the name of any city, it auto-corrects auto to forever. I'm spending a week in forever. Forever was hotter than ever this year. Forever is expensive, but oh, the museums, and all of its miseries ours. I'm afraid this is a COVID poem. It's called Celebration. Uh, and the singer uh, is Katie Lang. A singer some of us remember announced that she is celebrating her elderly mother's birthday Corvid style this year. <laughs> some of us would like to imagine living and being loved forever. And some of us would like to hear what groups of animals are called. So happy birthday to a smack of jellyfish and many more to a tower of giraffes. How old are you, sweet knot of toads? How old? The singer meant to write COVID style, but nobody I know wants to see a virus pop out of the cake. Corvids, on the other hand, a hundred blue jays with buttercream streaking their feathers, a hundred magpies with golden crumbs clinging to their beaks, a hundred crows with the receding light of a hundred candles illuminating the blue-black hinges of their wings as hundredly they rise. Who wouldn't want to live long enough, to be loved long enough, to get to watch them when they soar away? Uh, maybe I'll get my tight old mojo back sometime, but this one's called Cruelty. <laughs> In America, I wait in a line that's a circle. In American, I pick a side, but the question of whether a thing without shape can have a side persists. Everyone goes, ha ha. I didn't choose anything. I landed here because I forgot to check a box. The crowd is chanting, what do we want? Propaganda. When do we want it? Yes. <laughs> this Pope is starting to grow on me, but they charge extra to let you touch his crown. We live in an urban legend, a country legend, a mid-Atlantic state like the one where they send all the American newscasters to make them sound like home. If you're not sure how many people currently live in your home, you may be very rich or very poor. The boy who runs over a hundred caterpillars with his bike on a summer afternoon has to learn that to unlearn cruelty isn't so hard. If I look up how many songbirds were eaten by house cats this year, I'll be despondent. 
so I search instead for the past tense of shine. We can't have anything, can we? I know the Pope doesn't wear a crown. It's called the papal tiara, which is a much higher form of drag. <laughs> One time, I saw the Vatican and didn't realize that's what I was seeing. But even from a distance, there's something about the way it's shown. The crowd is chanting louder, louder, and I move my mouth around the wrong words, hoping no one can read my lips behind the sign. Uh, I, I never show poems in progress to anyone, but I showed one to Mary Jo, and she helped me decide how to end it a little bit better, so thank you for that. The only time I went to Paris. Alice B. Toklas said, you don't really know a book until you've typed and proofread it, and then you'll never know a painting unless you dust it every day. Sometimes I'm practical, but mostly I'm absurd. It seems like Alice would praised both qualities while secretly preferring the former. I miss placing my hand on the shoulders of my friends. Once I stood outside the building where Alice lived with Gertrude, and it felt like a cultural achievement. If I'd found the nerve to ring the bell, history might have buzzed me in. Later that evening, a friend told me he'd walked through the iron gates, through the courtyard, and into the building as one of the tenants was leaving for the day. The risk of having a friend with better stories than your own is that you end up liking the stories better than the friend. I wonder whether Alice preferred story to friends. I should ask her next time I visit. I'll even offer to help her with the dusting. We'll start with the paintings closest to the ceiling and work our way lovingly down. Um, okay, so um, 13th Balloon is what I call an elegy in pieces. Um, and the pieces aren't titled, so um, when I read a little, a little chunk of them that I'm going to read, I'll just sort of pause in between. Um, and by way of introduction, I'll read what's on the back cover, which is a, a old news, newspaper clipping from 1992. Albany, New York. Nearly 600 balloons floated over the Washington Park Lake Sunday as a visual reminder of those who have died from acquired immune de deficiency syndrome and those still alive struggling with the disease. The Lift for Life project was organized to increase awareness about AIDS in this area and to raise money for AIDS treatment and housing for those suffering from the disease. For some, the event coincided with personal tragedy. Twelve balloons were sponsored for Mark Crest, 25 of Albany, who died Saturday night from AIDS. One of the only facts I can find online about you is wrong. You didn't die on a Saturday night. You died on a Tuesday. It was a Tuesday morning. The sun was frozen, and Mars or Venus barely glowed somewhere or Mars was hidden in Tuesday, or Venus had broken into a billion splinters of ice and covered the grass outside the hospital, and then the sun dragged with it your death from the frozen pit out of which daily it rises. Unless I too am wrong, and Thursday was the day the nurse called and told us, it's time, you should come now, he's getting ready to go. Ready to go, after how many times we thought you were going, or were ready to go, or had gone. After how many times I'd arrived at the hospital, thinking it would be the last, only to find you sitting up, doped up, cockeyed, grinning. You'd lift your head a little and say, hey, what'd you bring me, boo? And I'd climb into the bed with you and say, nothing good, just me. A few months after you died, I came home on a black and freezing night to find a small cardboard box on the steps outside my building. I opened the lid, and inside was a single newborn animal, hairless, pink, and clean. A rat, a guinea pig, I couldn't tell. Was it moving? I don't remember now. Why can't I remember that now? It can't have been moving. It couldn't have been alive. I considered my cat asleep in my apartment. Would he kill this creature if it lived? Did I have any milk? And how would I get any milk anyway inside this tiny thing that surely could not be alive? What kind of person would have come and left a baby, possibly dead animal, there in a box on my stoop? What kind? If this was a test, I failed it. 
I carried the box, three long blocks, to the river and threw it in. I have never so much as in the moment the box went under the surface of the water, stabbing and stabbing and stabbing itself with the moon's million obsidian knives, wished that I were dead. If death is a test, I fail. If death is a test, I pass. During the storm, your ashes drop out of the sky in clumps, and birds with sutures for eyes peck the outline of your silhouette onto the trunk of a petrified tree, and clouds shit mud on the sheets at night, and the trees piss phlegm and weep blood that covers the ground, and we slip and we crack open as faceless birds the sand to drink as they hideously flap their hideous wings and gorge themselves on ashes and pieces of teeth and fragments of bones that once were yours. Featherless birds dive into the furnace where you burned. They swoop in and out of the windows of hospital rooms and heavily, horribly swirl against what could be clouds or could be the ashes of others we've burned until the last of the birds engorges itself on so much of your death that finally it bursts like a boil in the sky. What might anyone have made of you and me as babies, born into the mess and ferment of the late 1960s, working class babies born to parents who themselves were babies during World War II? Were they worried already about Vietnam or about some other monstrous hand that would grab us from our cribs by our feet and throw us into the war that would be the war after that? They could not have known that our war, because everyone lands in one, would be with a virus or that one of the hands that failed to close quickly or tightly enough around it to stop it from killing you would also belong to the state. At the beginning of every war, every baby is replaced with a picture of a baby. In every eclipse, the sun is replaced with an x-ray of the sun. A person I knew for a short time, a short time after you died, guessed incorrectly that I would sleep with him and furthermore that I slept with a copy of Bartlett's familiar quotations next to my bed. Though wrong on both counts, he was right when he said I blushed absurdly and too easily. But when I told him about you, he was taken a, a little aback, perhaps surprised that I had lived through anything. I should remember now what Velvet Underground song, after I turned you down for the last time, he left on my answering machine in order to, to convey that I was no longer worthy even of his disdain. I never told him the book that was next to my bed with the copy of the selected poems of Frank O'Hara you had given me before you died. Yesterday, someone told me that Frank's friend, the painter Mike Goldberg, had died. And from here, I can see myself in my tenement room on a night more than two decades gone, opening to Frank's birthday ode to Mike when I reached down to the floor next to my bed to pick up the book that had been yours. Since you died, the house style could best be described as leaves that cling to trees too long to winter. I understand how to miss a hint, as I regularly watch the anger harbored against queer people inflate like innumerable soap bubbles in what passes for real time. A truce can soothe for as long as it lasts, and the extent to which it's meant. I set foot in a jungle once, so I know how things on earth can work. There were fewer animals than I expected, but I did see some leaf cutter ants, and I climbed an ancient pyramid and may have heard a monkey before returning to the lot where the bus had dropped me off. Near the gas station, some children were taunting a dog with awful mange. On the way back to the beach town where I was staying, a unit of young soldiers stopped the bus to search for whatever a soldier searches for. I remember their rifles and their boots and their silky eyelashes, and they looked like children to me then. To whom must they look like children now? You and I never called each other by the name we shared. It would have been like eating an echo, each of us checking opposite sides of a two-way mirror, the fog left by his own breath. Months after you died, I saw someone in a nightclub in a different city than the others in which our story crossed itself out. 
someone who knew us both, but as it turned out, not very well. He looked shocked to see me, a look I didn't expect, a look I didn't need him to explain, but holy shit, he said, I thought you were dead. We celebrated my not death with shots of something too sweet, and an hour later I was vomiting into a mop bucket in a coner of the club. The coelacanth was believed to be extinct for millions of years until the sea coughed one up off the coast of South Africa after a great storm. Its name comes from the Greek koilos, meaning hollow. Um, this little section has an epigraph um, from Mary, both Mary Jo Van's book, Elegy. Come on stage and be yourself, the elegist says to the dead. From here I can see a fountain and a statue of a president against a backdrop of not yet spectacular oaks and maples, rows of your friends in white folding chairs. Whatever flowers would still have been thriving in the park in the middle of September, I'm sure we were grateful for. When it was my turn to speak at your memorial, what did I say? A version of, you aren't really dead, or see you again. Some useless thing any other death-struck boy, lightly educated at state and city schools, might have said. Had I the gift of song, I might have sung, as another friend sang, an optimistic Irish song. Afterward, we collected the chairs to take back to the restaurant from which we borrowed them and where you used to work. We turned off the microphone and wheeled the podium away. Is there any song? And if there is, what is the name of the song that goes, Now I am your widow, who never was your bride? I'm going to stop there. Thank you. So much for coming, and um, thank you, Mark, for that reading, and Jen for that beautiful introduction. My great pleasure is to introduce Mary Jo Bang, who is going to read from her new translation of Dante's Purgatorio. And I also have questions for poets, so let's see what uh, Mary Jo had to say. Dead poet you'd most like to meet, Gerard Manley Hopkins. Favorite city. Sometimes New York City, sometimes Denver, once Paris, once Avignon, once Rome. I really want to know about those onces. <laughs> <laughs> Favorite food, Ms. Miss Hulling's coconut cake and Veuve Clicquot. Is Veuve Clicquot a food? Yes. First, I say yes. First concert you ever went to, Joan Baez, at the Washington University Fieldhouse, maybe 1964? Yikes. First book of poetry you owned, Final Harvest, Emily Dickinson's Poems, 1961. On a scale of one to 10, how American do you consider yourself? I should have been born in France, so I wouldn't keep forgetting my French. The profession you secretly wish you were. Poet. Um, I think many of us are familiar with Dante's Inferno, and even if we haven't read it, I think we sort of know its architecture and understand what happens in that um, amazing piece of literature. Um, fewer of us proceed to read Purgatorio, and maybe even fewer of us proceed to read Paradiso. I tried to read Purgatorio once many years ago, and I just could not do it. You know, Inferno is really fun. And you get to watch people endure the most spectacular punishments. And also just, you know, hell is just like so incredibly vividly drawn. Um, and as I started reading Mary Jo's Purgatorio just today, I know that you have done a great service for us. Because mm -hmm. this will be a Purgatorio that will definitely keep your attention. And to situate you, I'm just going to read um, the first two paragraphs 
of the introduction, and the introduction is spectacular. Thank you, Mary Jo. It is addressed to you, it is intimate, in its language, it really begins to give you a sense of the colloquial flavor and personableness of this translation. I don't know if you've ever tried to read Dante in translation, but sometimes you just endlessly feel like you're reading something that was truly written 500 years ago. But I think this translation is really interested in offering us um, a Dante and a journey through both Mary Jo's previous Inferno and this Purgatorio that feels like it can speak to us right now. Also, are we not in Purgatorio, my friends, concurrently? Oh yes, snap that snap. Okay, introduction from Mary Jo Bangs, Purgatorio. Finally, you're here, where the sea meets the feet of Mount Purgatory. You did it, you survived hell and its horrors, you travel through hell's ugly inner lobby and in all nine hideous circles, each smaller than the one above. You met and spoke to countless souls serving timeless sentences. On the ninth circle, you walked across three icy zones of betrayal all the way to Satan, who stood as he will stand for eternity, surrounded by giants and locked in a lake forever frozen over. From there, you found your way out through the underground where Satan's legs dangle in the void. You went against gravity through Middle Earth to get to the mountainous landmass formed by the rock displaced by Satan when, tossed out of heaven, he landed on Earth. That's all behind you now, and yet it's never out of mind. You never forget the lessons you learn by looking into the souls of others, nor should you. But here, unlike in hell, things will get better. It's safe to lift the metaphoric sails. All you have to do is walk up seven flights of steps, circle seven terraces, and you'll be at the terrestrial heaven where Beatrice, beloved since childhood, is waiting. That's only seven stories, a cinch. But hold on, only in fairy tales do wishes work. Snap, just like that. This is real life. On each of these terraces, you have to evolve, feel the weight of your earthly errors, pay down the debt of every mistake you've made, learn compassion. That's what this long haul is for. Mary Jo Bang is the author of eight poetry collections, including A Doll for Throwing, an Elegy, winner of the National Book Critics Circle Award and a New York Times notable book. She has also published an acclaimed translation of Dante's Inferno. Bang has received a fellowship from the Guggenheim Foundation, a Hodder Fellowship from Princeton University, and a Berlin, Berlin Prize Fellowship from the American Academy in Berlin. She is a professor of English and teaches in the creative writing program at Washington University here in St. Louis. She is our poet. Please welcome Mary Jo Bang. Thank you, Dana, for inviting um, Mark Bivens here and um, so that I could have a playmate, um, which has been so wonderful. And thank you, Mark, for reading. And um, thank you, Dana, for inviting me to read with him. And thank you, Jen, for um, introducing Mark and being part of the Poetry Society. And to Aaron Quick and to Ted Mathis, thank you. And thank you to my students who came um, to see me in the flesh. I feel like Emily Dickinson has finally left her house. <laughs> okay. I'm gonna read uh, one canto from um, Purgatorio. Actually, I want my um, phone. And then I'll read um, some new work. Sorry. 
going to set it at 20 minutes, which is what I'm supposed to read, and then hopefully I'll, um, it won't go on. Okay, so I thought I'd read um, one of the late cantos, and it's because it's where you meet Beatrice. And I have this major crush on Beatrice, and when I met her here in Canto 30 out of 33, um, I just couldn't believe how strong she was as a woman and that Dante had created that. So um, you'll see what I mean. Canto 30. So um, it, he's all the way up. He went up the seven um, terraces with Virgil. And uh, along the way, they meet another Roman poet, Stasius. And um, all along, when he starts feeling tired and says to Dante, I, you know, I mean, says to Virgil, I need a rest. I'm going to not make it otherwise. And Virgil will say, well, remember, Beatrice is at the top. And it's so sophomoric. You know, it's like, don't you want to see Beatrice? So I had this idea she was going to be this insipid woman. Um, so he first sees this procession of um, people, the apostles, and there's a chariot drawn by a griffin that is part um, lion and part bird. At that moment, the highest heaven's seven stars, which can't rise and can't set and can't be veiled except by a film of guilt, were making everyone there hyper aware like the lesser stars tell one to turn the rudder toward the port of what they must do, stop and stand still. That truthful group that had come before the griffin now turned to the chariot as if to its peace. Then one, like a heaven-sent messenger, sing-song shouted three times, come my bride from Lebanon, and then all the others echoed him. The way of the trumpet's last blast, each blessed will step from its cave, singing hallelujah with a regained voice. So here, over the divine car, there rose up at the voice of so great an elder, a hundred ministers and messengers of eternal light. Those are angels. All of them saying, thou art blessed, while throwing flowers all over and around it. Oh, offer lilies, your hands filled with them. I've seen how daybreak can begin with a totally rosy eastern sector, the rest of the sky stunningly clear, while the shaded face of the rising sun, softened by mist, allows the eye to look at it for a few breath-held seconds. The same here, inside a cloud of flowers being tossed up by angelic hands, then tumbling down again, turning inside out, and made out a woman, the top a white veil, with a wreath of olive leaves, the bottom a naked flame of red dress under a green coat. And my mind, even after it had been such a long time since I'd been stunned, trembling, and overwhelmed in her presence, even before my eyes recognized her, the virtue she emanated hidden in the occult, my mind felt the power of that ancient love. As soon as I was struck by the sight of that sublime virtue that had transfixed me before I'd outgrown childhood, I turned to my left with the same expectation with which a kiddo runs to its mother when afraid or upset to say to Virgil, there's not a cell in my body that isn't shaking. I'm starting to recognize the traces of my ancient flame. But Virgil had slipped away after having left us dumbfounded after him. Virgil, dearest father, Virgil, to whom I gave myself for safekeeping. However much our first mother lost, it wasn't enough to keep the cheeks the dew had washed from being muddied again with tears. Dante, just because Virgil's run off, don't cry yet. Save your crying. There's another sword coming to make you cry. A bit like an admiral who walks from stern to prow, overseeing the crew, managing the other boats, urging, do the right thing. From the left side of the chariot, when I turned at the sound of my name, recorded here out of utter necessity, I saw the woman who had first appeared to me behind the curtain of that angelic free-for-all, looking straight at me from across the stream. Still, the veil that fell from her head 
half of the chaplet of Minerva's leaves kept her appearance from being registered regally with a haughty attitude. She continued talking like someone who's, someone who's holding back the most searing critique for later. Look really well. I'm really Beatrice. I really am. How were you able to access the mountain? You know, don't you? Everyone here is happy. I lowered my eyes to the clear stream, seeing myself in it, faced with the weight of such shame. I looked awkwardly away at the grass. It can seem to a child that the mother is on her high horse. That's how she seemed to me. Such is the bitter taste of harsh, harsh pity. She stayed quiet and the angel suddenly sang, in thee, O oh Lord, I put my trust, but they went no further than my feet. Like the snow between the living rafters on the dorsal ridge of Italy, which freezes once it's blown and packed down by trapped winds, then liquefies, leaking and feeding off itself, just like the breath of a land with no shadows can act like a flame that makes a candle melt. Like that, I was without sighs or tears before the singing of those who are forever in tune with the eternal spheres. But when I sensed that their soft melodies were actually meant to show sympathy for me, as in lady, must you crush him? The ice around my strangled heart cracked and breath and water left my anguished chest, exiting through my mouth and eyes. She, still standing firm on the same side of the stopped chariot, turned and addressed the charitable angels with this. You are everlastingly vigilant all day. You don't waste your time with night or sleep while the century ticks away. I'm far more concerned that that sniveling one over there get the drift of what I'm saying, since his suffering still needs to equal his guilt. Not only through the work of the great wheel that breeds each seed for a unique end, according to its own fixed stars, but also through the largesse of divine grace, which makes rain clouds so high, try as we might, we can't ever see them. This one here, potentially still in his new life, having all that quick-witted aptitude, would have made an amazing demonstration. If a bad seed can grow in wasteland soil, the outcome in a landscape with assets is all the more malignant and thorny. For a while, I had my character hold him up, let him see you through my eyes, dragging him with me in the right direction. As soon as I arrived at the doorway of my second phase and let go of life, bingo, he ran off and took up with others. When I was moved up from flesh to spirit and had all grown up beauty and virtue, I was less dear to him, less appreciated. He changed directions and took a bad path chasing false images of good, no promise ever met, a bolt of nothing shot at nothing. Nor was it worth my begging for and being given divine inspiration for him. I used it to try to reach him in a dream. He didn't care. He was so low and all the earlier efforts, efforts toward his well-being had fallen so short, nothing was left but to show him the lost ones. That's why I went down there to the door of the dead and crying, directed my prayers to the one who led him here. God's supreme decree would be shredded to bits if Lethe were crossed and a meal like that got eaten without the piper being paid and scalding hot tears of remorse. Whoa, gee, that's so tough. <laughs> So um, these poems are from a manuscript that's called um, A Film in Which I Play Everyone. And um, it will be an actual book in uh, fall of 2023. So this poem um, is actually a poem dedicated to my teacher, Lucy Bracorio, and it's called The Echo to Lucy Bracorio. The transient snow in a shaken globe was making me think of a Moscovian dome below which, in a small private room called a cubiculum, I have read they had buried an impress's golden hair after she died, 
after they inquired eagerly for the Tardina, Sar Sardina, but she was nowhere to be found from the remotest periods to the present time. Snow becomes rain under the overhead rainforest showerhead, drop by imbecilic drop dripping onto a broken stone floor. About the absolute fracture that death represents, my brain believes in what I believe. Like any animal, we make our way. Amphibian, reptilian, mammalian. Some days more than others, I put away one moment and up comes another, a replenishing gold Virgilian bow. Outside, snow engulfs the asphalt, the sidewalks, the drivers. In a second, it seems, a million trains enter and exit the tunnel. The flood protected walls rise, a tower of torn eaves over a storm drenched oubliette. The dome dissolves, leaving only the ineffable portion of this time and the idea that we who are still here have kept what was left of her. Green earth, the crush beneath your feet, green grass, the you are here, located, your eyes closed, you shake your head and think, the sea was once everything we needed, Bowie singing, you like girls or boys, Bowie saying, I'll finance the film version in which I'll play everybody, the siren gets twinned in the violence of a scene that refuses to end. This is, the world is a statement. So is, a day will, meet the splintered ends of what went before it. The inhumanity, the rottenness. Night rolls in to stand watch, to see if we find our way. This on a rock moving through air, a century ticking away. I said the poet um, I'd most like to meet is um, Gerard Manley Hopkins. I don't know if I want to meet him, per se. <laughs> I just like reading his poem. And this poem takes um, its title from um, a poem by Gerard Manley Hopkins. And the poem is spelt from Sybil's Leaves. And the title is Our Evening is Over Us. And um, it comes from this section of that poem, spelled from Sybil's Leaf. So I thought I'd read a little bit of Hopkins. It starts midway through the poem. Heart, you round me right with our evening is over us. Our night whelms, whelms, and will end us. Only the beak-leaved boughs, dragonish damask, the tool smooth, bleak light, black, ever so black on it. Our tail. O oh, our oracle, let life wane, ah, let life wind off her one skein, stained vein variety upon all on two spools, part pen pack, now her all in two flocks, two folds, black, white, right, wrong, reckon but rep, but mind, but these two, where of a world, where but these two, tell each off the other of a rack where self wrung self-strung, cheap and shelterless, thoughts against thoughts, in groans rhymed. Our evening is over us. It's the trading in of the workday categories, hours, clouds that linger inside plate glass corner windows, a man's head blocking the view, to become instead a faint future caption of the bottom of a photo of hibiscus. There is no getting around the fact that each of us is a world of our own, an entity, a pageant of one. Just like you, I feel my way forward, letting the back of my hand brush against the matte wall as I watch the chiaroscuro movie of my mind. There should be no anxiety in knowing the world will die when we die. This is how it is with us. The real is wherever we are. The days refuse to stay put. Speaking is a way of living with the ruin we were given. 
Um, this poem that I'm about to read came out of an assignment. I taught a craft class in at Grace's, and one of the assignments was to go and um, spend time in a place that was big enough that you could spend hours there and um, let that place act on you. So um, I went to the Chase Park Plaza. Hotel Incognito. I was here once, but not looking like I do now. Someone filmed me on the balcony. A man held my hand while dancing. You could see I was wearing a backless black dress. On the way out, I ran into a mean girl I'd known years before. She was basically the same, equally awful, but older. She told me she'd married a judge. How apt, I thought. <laughs> How simply beyond repair. The pavement outside the plate glass sparkled in lamplight, mica embedded in a mattress of slate. I was walking away. The ghostly X at the center of the turning door kept pushing me out. I was going through the motions of deciding. I didn't belong. Not then, not there, not anywhere. Just checking because I don't want that to go on. Okay. I'll read two more poems. Speaking of the future, Hamlet is saying, someday this day will be over. A moon will presumably still be above, a bone quiet and inflatable in the scene, the cool blue swimming pool it finds itself in, and I will want to be. My mother, the queen, will want only my father, the king. All will be want and get, and I will be me. And oh, oh, Ophelia will be the essence of love, the love of a sister or the love of the brother, compassion, forgiveness. All will be want and get. We will all be together on stage and in dress, reciting our lines. What a fine day. What a wonderful way to be. No sirens, 50 stars, a cloud, a drawing of an all night sky. We'll be there, you as you and I. Hanging the curtain. The curtain was meant to hide the zoo of my petty vices, but instead it was a coat that kept falling off my shoulders, revealing a watch that kept adding up the hours. After finishing my shift, I sat with a pill in my hand, then thought better of it and dropped it back into its plastic. In the family album, I stood at the edge, a dented girl with a divided mind, daily the same awareness, it was only a matter of time before someone would act with cruelty. Now looking back, I see, will you, won't you join the dance? As the ever pestering question. In the side yard, six rabbits in a cage, lettuce torn to bits, silent rats consorting with rusting tin cans at the bottom of the drainage ditch, occasional victims of a stepfather's shotgun. Once a year, fireworks sounded the night out. A weeping shrub occupied the corner yard. The flowering branches bent like water falling from an active fountain. When I hit my limit, I crawled under it to escape the conceptual blur. Actually, I think I can read one more. So here we all are with Daphne. Now, um, often my um, students put myths in poems, and I have to remind them that a lot of people don't know myths. Um, but I always hope that they'll know Daphne, because um, it's such a arresting story that Daphne was being pursued by Apollo, who was going to sexually assault her. And so she called out to her father, the river god, and he turned her into a tree. And I've always been really bitter about that because that doesn't seem like a rescue. 
that it seemed to me that he was saying, you want to be rigid and not give in? So I'll make you rigid. I'll put you, make you into a tree. So here we all are with Daphne. Here we all are at the waterfall, aligned and fixed like stars overhead, that limited canopy under which the laughter of a cosmic joke echoes out into space. I'm one of the many waiting for the billow to be like it is on the sea, full body, beautiful, a more than adequate distraction from the war that gets fought inside. We are all dying, but some more than most, so says my interiority. It talks to me as green fills the screen. It takes my arm and walks alongside me. I never ask where I'm going. I know I'm not meant to arrive. Me in my nice clothes, cupwork dress, blindfold of bark from the moment a man turned me into a tree. See, he said, isn't this all for the better? You with no mouth to speak of? By you, he meant me. Thank you so much. So I'm going to ask the first question, but you should please not hesitate. Um, and I'll have a microphone, and I'll bring it your way. So Mark, would you join Mary Jo on stage? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Will you, won't you join the dance? Yes. That's from Alice in Wonderland. Yeah. <laughs> I'm really glad to be in person. It's really nice to hear poetry in person. So here's my question, and this first question is for Mark. So Mark, your book came out in February of 20, and then within a month, we find ourselves in pandemic. And I'm just so curious, like, how did you feel about this in relationship to this book that is this incredible chronicle of having gone through another time of pandemic? And then finding us here with COVID, and just how did how did that all feel? Tedious. <laughs> no, I felt as you must often feel. You know, I felt oracular. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, I I don't know. I mean, the the whole um, the whole writing and production and publication of the books, maybe especially of poetry. I don't know. It was so. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it was fine. Um, no, I, I yeah, I mean certainly um, I mean I like irony, but not that much. You know, I, the, the, the to have this book appear um, at the beginning of a brand new plague. Um, but yeah, it was, was apt in, in some ways. But honestly, I, I and this is a gross inside baseball kind of thing to point out, but so much of what happens with, uh, with books um, in terms of uh, trying to get reviews and things like that happens way in advance. Um, so I was less worried about it kind of disappearing. Um, and then our, our press, Copper Canyon, was really great about sort of like saying, okay, we're going to adapt, we're going to have Zoom ratings. And at, you know, and at first, when people were still um, not completely fatigued by that, we were able to, um, you know, read to what felt like a lot of people and maybe more people than might have just been coming to readings. Um, so, as awful as it was, and, you know, not as I don't like the, the idea of silver linings for horrible, horrible things, but. Um, you know, the, the fact that we were forced to adapt, but maybe more people were, were able to um, connect with the book than they might have otherwise. And maybe there, maybe there was some, I don't know, weird, gross, like, resonance or consolation that happened because of the, the two plagues sort of going on. I don't know. I, there's a, if I, this is not really a plug, but I had the chance to do a conversation online at the, at the magazine Garanga with Paul Lisicki, who had a beautiful memoir um, 
that came out around the same time with those 13th balloon. And so we talked quite a bit about that. And much of his is set in Provincetown, um, and it, you know, it's about the AIDS epidemic. So I, I don't know. There, there, I feel like there are um, lots of places where I could have stopped answering that question, and this is it. <laughs> Excellent. I realize I should go get that other microphone and hear it. It's very dumb. You could keep that one. It's yours. They'll love me on the plane with this. <laughs> Um, Mary Jo, yeah. how was it working on Purgatorium during this time period? Well, it was Purgatorial, and um, I would get up in the morning and start working, and <clears throat> maybe around 3, think I should eat something and then come back, and around 11 or 12, think I should go to bed, and <laughs> then I would wake up in the morning and do it again, because I had a deadline, and I had taken off a semester um, without pay in order to finish the notes. And so I had to keep working. And at one point, I emailed my editor and I said, you know, I, I'm really working hard, but I might be a little late. And he said, oh, no, no, you can't be. Um, we'd have to delay the book because um, everything is set for this time schedule. So I just couldn't, um, you know, and then I start staying up till 2 in order to make up for the hours I was sleeping. And um, so, yeah, it felt like purgatory. But as I mentioned to you when we were talking before, that then when it was finished and I sent it off, I was struck with how many hours there are in a day. It's like, <laughs> what do people do? And I heard a lot about people were cooking a lot. And I thought, OK, I can see that. You know, the peanut butter sandwiches and ice cream sandwiches and all kind of sandwiches had been great, but I could now start stirring things in a pot and, you know, that would take up some time. And I, I knew people sometimes cleaned and I wasn't going to go there. So I thought, you know, stay with the cooking. And then I did that for a while and then I would get the manuscript back for, you know, copy editing and then I'd fall into that wormhole. You know, it, I, isn't it true that in um, purgatory, in Dante purgatory, time is odd, or the sun rises in the west, or isn't there something about that? That's right. That's right. The isn't sun opposites. Everything's opposite because we're on the other side of the world. And in that day, in the medieval era, they thought that the um, southern hemisphere was just water. Oh. And there were some, and so the land mass that is Mount Purgatory is a pure Dantean invention, and the idea is that when um, when Satan falls, there's this propulsion of the earth that makes the funnel of hell is pushed out the other side and becomes a mountain. Oh, I see. Yeah. Right. So the funnel, I get it. Yeah. So um, I just think of you in your apartment living in this weird world where time yeah. is running backwards and into itself and you know just kind of like this Dantean time weird cycle as you're working on this like in the middle of a, a lockdown yeah yeah it was <laughs> does anybody have questions for Mark or Mary Jo no question is too strange or dumb all questions are interesting yes I, um, I have one for Mary Jo. Um, yeah, I'm wondering about your new work, and I know a lot of your work is ekphrastic, or it's like pulling from kind of like like specific time periods. I'm thinking about like the the modernist photography one, and I'm wondering if um, like transiting Dante is that is that feeding into your work as well? Like I feel like going to Daphne is a little bit older of an illusion in some of the other things that you've written, so I'm just wondering. I, I learn about a lot of myth because he draws on Ovid quite a bit, and so I'm refreshed. My knowledge is refreshed, or new knowledge of all of these things. But as I said um, when I was about to read that, that I'm very cautious about um, using things that the um, reader is not likely to also know. So I try to make 
in a sense, to contextualize. So that idea of a blindfold of bark, you know, maybe will stir someone's memory that this is the figure who turned into the tree. But the idea of a man turning someone into a non-speaker, um, I, I hope will resonate, um, re regardless of, you know, whether you know who Daphne is. Um, and that, um, that line about the billow and the sea actually comes from a Dickinson poem. So all of my poems are a kind of um, I, I'm resisting saying collage because that doesn't communicate, but I'm taking things from all kinds of places. So I'm taking that poem about the um, the hotel. There, the the woman that I saw on the way out. I didn't see her on the way out. I saw her at a high school reunion. You know, it's like I'm taking these little things and I'm using them as um, material to create something that has the same interiority that I have. But the it's almost like a novelist inventing, but I'm inventing based on little experiences I've had, but I know when to use them, or I, I hope I do know when to employ them. It's like splicing. I'm sorry? It's like poetry writing is splicing. Like yeah. splicing yeah. frames. That's right. To create a film. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Films. Any other questions? Wondering about your the, the decision to jettison the curse of Lima in the entire project is that I guess I don't even really know what the question is, but you know a number of other translators work themselves into knots to retain it, and I'm curious how that decision was made and whether you feel like poor Italians like you think you could have lost with that at least in terms of the curse of Lima. Yeah, the problem is very few. Um, people do Terence Rima, and the reason is that English is a rhyme poor language compared to Romance languages, which have all those similar uh, word endings. And so it's really hard. There's a kind of virtuoso translation by the um, Irish poet um, Kieran Carson that was published by the New York Review of Books Press, I think in 2000, um, and he uses Terence Rima. But because you're desperate for a rhyme, you are pushed into saying things that are not really fluid, fluent, and so they call a lot of attention to themselves. And so he's sort of not a comic persona so much as a freewheeling, so that he would vary the register of the language quite a bit. So you'd have Faust and Kanst but then you'd have Virgil calling Dante adult. Um, and so he kind of did that. But when I read that, I realized that that undermines the pathos and the terror of Inferno. And I wanted that. And so I decided I would pick a register. And then I would try to substitute you know, the, um, the sonic elements of contemporary verse, which are internal rhyme, sight rhyme, off rhyme, alliteration, assonance, all kinds of phonic echoes. And instead of the, you know, the pattern of Terzarima is the first and the third line rhyme, that non-rhyming middle line becomes the first and third rhyme of the next canto, I mean the next tercet. And so you have this interlocking rhyme. And he had, he invented that for this poem. And it has lots of things to do with the subject, the Trinity, for instance, and this idea of God being love and that one thing gives birth to another. So knowledge gives birth to love, which gives birth to a closeness to God, which gives birth to love, which gives birth to knowledge. And so it's all in dialogue with that. But it's really hard. And some people go to prose because of that difficulty yeah. with the rhyme for English. Is it, is it, Kinsky's Inferno is 
It's not Terence Reed. Oh, I thought it was. No, and in fact, what he does is he shortens. He made an odd statement. I find it odd that he thought that Italian had too many syllables in it, <laughs> and so he would throw out whole uh, tercets, oh. and each canto was shorter. Oh my! I know. I have no idea. Yeah, and <laughs> Clive James, when he did his, decided that the quatrain would actually be better than the tercet, and so he did that. So, you know, you get people um, making decisions based on what's best in English, and that makes sense, but sometimes they're making other decisions that don't quite seem, I don't know. Well, in your note on the translation in the book, I found this illuminating. You said that to get that kind of sonic harmony, you went to slant rhyme and internal rhyme and assonance and alliteration and all of the ways that we tend to make music when writing in English. Right. And that made total sense to me in terms of, you know, trying to retain some kind of sonic harmony in, in working on this. And I could hear it too tonight. And as I was reading it, I could, I could see what was happening. And I thought that was, I, I loved that, the visuals. I don't, I don't quite know. Um, I had written a, a, a little bit about it when I was just starting to write poems, because that's around when it happened. Um, uh, and yeah, and I, I had published a book in uh, 2016 and was sort of writing new poems that I figured would, I guess, be the next book. Um, and then this other thing started happening. And actually, the, the, the poem that Jen wrote, which we read, sorry. The poem that Jen so beautifully read um, was actually the first thing that just announced itself to me. And I had no idea why or what it was doing. I put it aside. Um, and then they just kind of kept coming. And I didn't know why or what they were doing. Um, and maybe after, I don't know, a 10 or a dozen of those, I realized what it was and what I, you know, what I was supposed to be writing about. And I don't say that like in a sort of mystical sense at all. Um, I guess, you know, it, it just bubbled up really. And, and what, but then once I figured out what it was, um, it kind of took over. Um, and again, not the corny sort of it wrote itself kind of kind of thing, but I was surprised by the momentum that it took on. Um, yeah. Do you give any credence to it as an oracular uh, thing coming through you in advance of where we find ourselves now? I know you're not quite calibrated that way. I am. No, I mean, no, I mean, I, I, I think. Retrospectively, I see that about many things that have happened in my life that that I may be calibrated to that. But if I feel like if I um, embrace that too hard, uh, you'll have to put on this. It'll, 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 <laughs> get back into jewelry. Um, no, that, that, that I think it would it would either go away or it would be too big for me to even handle. So, um, yeah. When you realized what you were writing, were you like, oh, no, or were you like, okay? Not, yeah, not, not really, oh, no. I was just sort of, yeah, okay. And it, and it, was, it, it was weird to, um, wait, and I point this, I say this in the book that his name was Mark. Um, so, I, so there was a decision to like uh, use the second person address for the whole thing because I didn't want it to seem like, meta or whatever like you know um or confusing um and another fun thing that happens to me now is that i forget what i'm saying in the middle of what i'm uh, saying but um 
I, I want to say something. Great. I want to say something to you because I wonder, you said to me at some point, you were talking about the fact that you had this experience and that a lot of young people, their experience is very different in terms of anxieties about AIDS and things like that. And you felt that there might be some value in exploring that. And when you were telling me about it, I thought you were talking about a memoir. And so this whole time you were writing these poems, I thought you were writing a memoir. Do you remember when you gave me the manuscript to look at it? It's like, these are poems. And, um, but you had that idea. Which, which I knew, it wasn't, you know, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that idea led into it, or you dropped that idea and then one day just started doing it? Yeah, no, it didn't lead into it, but I realized as I was doing it that, that maybe I could be doing some kind of service for, you know, a, a generation of people who, you know, are, may not have been born uh, even before um, the sort of cocktail treatment that was ultimately pretty effective. Like they, they, they wouldn't remember a time when, when this was um, a, a, a thing that you know, we, we all, queer people especially, were not we all too. And, and another a direction I didn't go in the book was to try to address the, 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 the fact that it's not, AIDS is not gone. There's still, you know, many people die of it. It's just that they often die in places that Americans don't think about or care about. Um, and so I, I, I felt like I needed to sort of stay in my lane in terms of, you know, just kind of telling my story to Mark about this and, and not trying to sort of like be comprehensive. Um, and I haven't read this yet, but the, uh, the, the writer Matilda Bernstein Sycamore has a, a new anthology out that is, it's all prose, but it's essays about, by writers who talk about growing up in that weird, I hate this phrase, liminal space of, um, you know, sort of pre and post AIDS, um, and that kind of my generation who grew up with it as a fact of life slash death, um, but are, you know, just sort of how that <laughs> fucked us all up. Um, and yeah, so that, that's recommended reading that I haven't read, but we could read it together. Matilda Bernstein, Sycamore. Well, our poets are here, and they will sign your books um, and um, and answer any questions you might have for them if they occur. Thank you so much for coming. Please um, just keep an ear open for um, the roster of events for Mary Ripple and Mark Underwood. I know the show will open on March 4th. We're still a little murky on other dates for things. There will be Mary will do a gallery talk, and there will also be a reading of uh, poetry by both Mark Underwood and Mary. So I hope you're good for that. Thank you so much and thank you.